For our last episode of African Roots, we give the floor to two of Africa's greatest liberation heroes. They both hail from Southern Africa and their legacies are still felt today, and far beyond their nations too. One was a lawyer and the other a studious academic. Today, they are both legends. Welcome to African Roots, brought to you by DW. We discover how individuals from across Africa have shaped the continent. I'm Leila Johnson Salami. And I'm Kai Nebe. On African Roots, we've had plenty of movers and shakers, but I want to talk about a nation builder from Southern Africa. His surname, Kai, begins with M. Oh, it's not Mandela, please. Please don't let it be Mandela. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's a very obvious first answer or first guess, but no, it's not Mandela. Um, It's Mozambique's Eduardo Mondlane. Now, for a man called the father of Mozambique, he cuts a surprisingly forgotten figure in the decolonization history of Southern Africa. Okay, how so? Well, in Southern Africa, the decolonization process was somewhat delayed. Um... Most nations in East, Central, and West Africa became independent in the 1960s. Meanwhile, the two Portuguese colonies of Mozambique and Angola only gained independence in 1975. Zimbabwe in 1980 and Namibia, as I'm sure you would know, in 1990. Um, And while South Africa technically became independent in 1910, uh, majority rule only came when apartheid fell in 1994. Wow. Well, that's so. So so it does seem in Southern Africa that while independence was tangible, it seemed like the further south you went on the continent, the more unreachable it was yeah but you know it's even more complicated than that um anyway it's against this backdrop that you have mozambique and eduardo mondlane while he is called the father of mozambique he never actually led his country you mean he never became president yeah but let me start at the beginning go ahead so eduardo mondlane was born in 1920 in portuguese east africa He was the son of a tribal chief in the southern territory of Manjacaze. Now, Mondlane had an extraordinary educational path, um, probably helped by his family's local standing. He was educated at a Swiss Presbyterian school, and he studied at South Africa's Witwatersrand University until 1949. Um, before he was then kicked out uh, as the apartheid system banned black students from attending so-called white universities. Wow. So, well, with that, did that mean he had to stop his education completely or what? Um, No, in fact, that was just the beginning. Um, He moved to Portugal and enrolled at the University of Lisbon, and then he transferred to Oberlin College in uh, the United States. What? So that's... One, two, three continents already that he's been stu- that he studied on. Exactly, and um, it's not over just yet. So he became an anthropologist and was also a professor of history and sociology at Syracuse University. Um, his job allowed him to travel across Africa before the wave of independence for research purposes. And I mention this because it shows how Mondlane's education and employment helped to inform his ideas about Africa's liberation. And remember, he didn't always work in circles that were sympathetic to African self-governance. Sure, and I guess at this point, you know, most African countries actually weren't independent. But um, I'm getting the impression that he could have... He, he had all sorts of doors open. He could have been anything. There's no debate about that. Uh, he was one of Africa's great minds and could have had a very comfortable career as a scholar and researcher, for which he certainly had the chops. Mm, but I'm sensing you're about to tell me that that's more or less exactly what he didn't do or what. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. In 1957, Mondlane worked for the United Nations, researching issues about African countries' independence, and this includes visits to the Cameroons, okay, and it culminates in a family visit to Portuguese East Africa in the early 60s. It's 
Mondlane's first trip home in 11 years, Kai, and this trip changes everything for him. Okay. After building up contacts in Mozambique, Mondlane returns to America and he resigns from his UN post. In 1962, he then flies to Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and co-founds the Mozambican Liberation Front, Frelimo, to liberate Mozambique from Portuguese colonialism. Maputo-based journalist Luis Nachote explains how. The unity of Mozambique, at least in terms of the ideals conceived by Frelimo, is due to Mondlane. He left the United Nations to fight for Mozambique's independence. After career as a doctoral level anthropologist and sociologist at the University of Syracuse in the United States, he found three scattered Mozambican movements, Udenamo, Unami, and Manu. He realized the quickest way for the fight to be fairer and more consistent was to unite these three movements. Mondlane became the movement's first president, and he united a disparate group of exiled revolutionaries into a front with a single purpose, freeing Mozambique. Right, so he did this from exile though, right? Yeah, he did. The recently independent Tanzania, under the leadership of Julius Nyerere, allowed Frelimo to set up bases and military training camps. And, you know, Tanzania borders Mozambique to the north, right, along the Swahili coast. And many Mozambicans joined the movement in exile. Was this because they just, it was too dangerous within Mozambique? Yeah, you know, Mondlane's pro-independence views and prominence made him an unwelcome person in Portuguese East Africa. And especially worrisome for the colonial authorities was a united front against Portuguese occupation. Remember that most colonial governments had remained in power in Africa for so long, specifically because they had sought to divide and rule, often along tribal lines. And so Mondlane was the guy who was kind of advocating for the exact opposite of this. That's it. And that's why his influence was so feared. I mean, his global exposure at the United Nations and a vision for a free Mozambique probably made him the most famous Mozambican in the 1960s, aside perhaps from the footballer that we all know, Eusebio. Um, <laughs> sociologist Alicio Macamo says Mondlane would be remembered for his quest to unite Mozambique. My image of him is that of a very pragmatic politician, very tolerant and truly committed to the national project. A very important aspect of his political approach is that he saw the liberation movement as a broad church within which various political and ideological sensibilities would fit. It's really funny that you bring up Eusebio, um, because as a football fan, I know that many European clubs, uh, you know, this is a bit of a sidetrack to football, but I know that many European clubs actually took talented uh, football players from the colonies and naturalized them as Portuguese or whichever particular nation they were part of. Well, actually, Kai, that's a good point. And just to sidetrack a bit here, you know, at the 1966 FIFA World Cup, Portugal came third and their team was spearheaded by Eusebio, who scored the most goals, by the way. And as you can imagine, he has several nicknames as well. <laughs> OK, like what? Well, apparently he was known as the Black Panther, the Black Pearl, or simply also known as the King because he was just that good. Wow, those are epic names. <laughs> I have to say that I would pick any any of those three. I'll go with the King. <laughs> But um, he, he wasn't the only Mozambican-born player on the team, by the way. Um, the other was team captain Mario Coluna. Now, both were scouted as footballers in Mozambique and then had long careers at Benfica, which was Portugal's most successful club at the time and still is one of their most successful clubs. All right. But what does this have to do with Mondlane, if I may ask? <laughs> We'll get to that. I mean, even though they were Mozambican born and black, um, they were considered Portuguese. And I guess this really reflects Portugal's attitude 
to Mozambique. Like it was Portuguese and it was theirs. And also how important the African colonies were for the Portuguese dictatorship's image of itself as a world power. Now, this explains why Portugal was so reluctant, Kai, to let its African colonies go in the 1960s. By the way, also, when Kaluna died in 2014, uh, independent Mozambique gave him a state funeral. And that tells you a lot about how Mozambicans felt about him. Wow. <laughs> I have to say, Lila, I did not expect a football nerd inside of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. And I mean, obviously also. <laughs> um, but I do think that uh, that little story is relevant to Mondlane because while two Mozambicans were lighting up the World Cup, he was gathering support for his country's independence. So, in 1963, Mondlane moved his family to Tanzania and dedicated his life to the liberation struggle. So, Le- so Leila, when you say a liberation struggle, does that mean Eduardo Mondlane, did he actually fight or what, what did he do? Well, we would have to define fight here. I mean, although Mondlane was never a soldier, he used his connections, charisma and his diplomacy skills for fundraising and spreading the ideals of Mozambican independence. Most successfully, by the way, among churches, other African states and the Soviet Union, his efforts to create a Mozambican fighting force also paid off. And in 1969, Frelimo guerrillas were attacking Portuguese positions in northern Mozambique. Um, He was the undisputed leader, by the way, of the liberation movement. And his book, which is titled The Struggle for Mozambique, became the manifesto for Mozambican independence, explains Elisio Macamo. Mozambique is visto como o culminar de um processo. Mozambique is seen as a culmination of a process, a process that is influenced by all kinds of currents. It is influenced by the African culture, other cultures, but above all, by ideas. The idea of human dignity is very important, and it's very well described in this book, The Struggle for Mozambique. But Leila, if all the other ex-colonies were getting you know, independence by the 1960s, then why did it take so long for Mozambique to become independent? I know you mentioned that it was a prestigious colony, but why? Kai, you ask very big questions, don't you? (laughs) Well, the authoritarian anti-communist Portuguese government in the 1960s, um, which indirectly worked with apartheid South Africa, tried to hold on to its colonial empire longer, more as a point of pride. But Many left-leaning army officers knew the colonial wars were unwinnable and would drain Portuguese resources. And in 1975, they initiated... The Carnation Revolution. Revolution. There we go. (laughs) And the new leaders quickly granted Mozambique and other Portuguese colonies their freedom. A certain man from Guinea-Bissau called Amilcar Cabral also had so much to do with it. And you can hear more about him on another episode that we've done on African roots. Okay, so all's well that ends well? Well, no. Unfortunately, 1975 came too late for Mondlane. Why? Well, in 1969, Mondlane was going through his post in Dar es Salaam when a parcel bomb exploded, killing him. And do we know who was behind it? Well, it was never proven conclusively. Uh, Mondlane, despite being an open character and clearly fighting for the liberation of Mozambique, had rivals in Frelimo, but he also had other enemies in Portugal's secret service for his anti-colonialist goals. But, you know, the thing is, Kai, his death really weakened Frelimo, which was then taken over by Samora Michel, um, the movement's military commander. And... While Mozambique did gain independence in 1975, the movement had fragmented and wasn't the universal force that it was in exile. In 1977, Mozambique entered a civil war and unfortunately that lasted until 1992 as Frelimo and Renamo rebels fought for control. The great legacy of Eduardo Mondlane is the aim of Mozambican national unity. Today, his dream may be fragmented because of tribalism in Mozambique, 
But this doesn't take away from his ideal to create a united Mozambican nation. That's Mozambican journalist Luis Nachote on Mondlane's ideals. This, this is quite a sad ending then. Does it mean that Eduardo Mondlane's dream of a united Mozambique kind of died in its infancy? Yeah, and I think many wonder what could have been if his statesmanship was carried over. come back, we head south across the Mozambican border and meet arguably the most famous moral leader in history. DW, African Roots. Find new African Roots episodes on dw.com slash African Roots, Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you get your podcasts. Well, Kai, you certainly raised the stakes with that teaser, the most famous moral leader in history. Um, although I think I, I can tell from that hint of yours. Yeah, I know it's, a, it's, it's very hard to quantify, but so many things are hard to quantify when you're talking about Nelson Mandela. <laughs> I knew it. And hence you're panicking when you got my riddle right at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of worried. It's like, oh no, Le- Leila is going to jump the gun here a bit. But I'm glad. I mean, Eduardo Mondlane as well, for different reasons and also in a different era, is certainly a very fascinating character. I mean, really, I had no idea about the, the stuff he went through to actually bring Frelimo into being in the 1960s. That, that was very fascinating. As for Mandela, I mean, as you know, Leila, I mean, he's synonymous with South Africa. He's synonymous with Africa. I mean, I was once in rural Mongolia a while back, and even there, there were some children that were asking me if I knew Mandela. He certainly is famous in every corner of the globe, that's for sure. So I think perhaps the best place to start with Mandela is the 11th of February in 1990. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man taking his first steps into a new South Africa. I know this moment. The first time Mandela was a free man in decades, right? Yes, and to put it mildly, Mandela's release from prison was seismic, not just for South Africa's own liberation from the racist apartheid regime, but also in terms of liberation for the continent as a whole. You know, you have to remember South Africa was this long last white holdout on the continent of Africa. But Mandela's release itself was a little bit chaotic, you know, South Africa's apartheid government leader, F.W. de Klerk, had called a press conference the day before, saying the African National Congress, the South African Communist Party, and others would be unbanned, uh, i.e. they would not be illegal anymore. And this set off like a massive scramble because de Klerk also said Mandela, after Mandela had spent 27 years behind bars, would also be released. And despite being imprisoned, Mandela was still very much the de facto liberation leader, right? Very much so, especially to people outside of uh, South Africa. And the growing anti-apartheid movement inside and outside of South Africa, Mandela was the man, you know. And this was a huge deal. Mandela's first speech after being released was planned at the Grand Parade in Cape Town. And there was one person there who I do know, my mom, in fact. Really? (laughs) Yes, she was in Namibia at the time. And when the news broke the day before uh, Mandela would be released, she jumped in a car and raced through the night to Cape Town to be there for that moment. It was a Saturday afternoon and um, I had a day off work. I was working for a local newspaper then. And the four o'clock news on the radio came on and an announcement that the next day... Nelson Mandela would be released from Victor Vestere prison. That was a real shock, being in Vinduk in Namibia at the time, which is about a 15-hour drive from Cape Town. It just seemed to me doable to get there. Um, And what an opportunity not to miss. That's amazing. And did she get there? Well, I'll let her answer that. We got to the border, I would say, around about 3 a.m., and... There on the desk of the border guard was um, one of the newspaper's first editions. 
with a photograph of Nelson Mandela, the first time that anybody had seen a photograph of Nelson Mandela as he looked in 1990, because it had been illegal to um, represent images of him um, in, in the media before that. So that was, it was really going to happen. He was really going to be released. The place where he would be speaking, making his spe first speech, that was at the City Hall in Cape Town. Um, and the crowds were gathering on a big area of land known as the Parade Ground, which is between the, the City Hall and the, and the train station. When you actually got there, well, can you describe a bit the atmosphere? It was, it was a kind of a, a wait and see sort of feeling at the time because there was always this, this worry that it might not happen, it might not happen. But some um, people were arriving in their hundreds and then in their thousands. I think the final estimate was around 50,000 in that parade ground. The, the release was a little delayed. It got a little tense, actually, at one stage because there were so many people piling into the parade ground and the city hall is basically a, a sort of a solid wall at one end of it. There was some looting that was beginning in shops and some shooting began. And I think that really gave everybody a, a reality check that things could go very wrong unless, unless everybody wanted to make this work and be the occasion that it should be. Was it the occasion that uh, everyone, you know, hoped it would be? The delay was such that it was it was getting dark. We were aware that there was movement on the balcony in the city hall and then we were aware that there was presence on the balcony and and then Mandela started to speak. Comrades and fellow South Africans I greet you all in the name of peace. Just listening to that voice that everybody had been waiting for for so long, free now to speak. I stand here before you not as a prophet, but as a humble servant of you, the people. The authority of it, the, the he spoke with great humility. Your tireless and heroic sacrifices have made it possible for me to be here today. And also very assertive about what was going to be done um, from from here on. A really marvelous moment for me. I know that this is not true because I've I've listened to footage since, um, and I know that there was that there was quite a lot of noise around because there were so many people. But for me, it just seemed that everything had fallen silent at that moment when he started to speak, and it, it was a really really powerful moment. I extend my sincere and warmest gratitude to the millions of my compatriots and those in every... Wow. But Kai, if Mandela's release was pivotal to ending white rule in South Africa, what's de Klerk's motive? Well, there was a lot of opposition to this, to this very move of releasing Mandela and unbanning all the political parties from white minorities. Uh, apartheid had privileged white people for decades and reduced the overwhelming black population in South Africa pretty much to second class citizens. But by 1990, de Klerk realized that South Africa's model of separate development, which is what apartheid means, was completely unsustainable. Why is that? Well, there, there are many reasons, but primarily South Africa was a pariah state. Um... Very few nations openly supported this morally bankrupt government, which, along with the obviously racist policy of apartheid, also had been guilty of fomenting violent ethnic clashes in South Africa, committing brutal atrocities and murders against political opponents, and also conducting covert wars in Angola and Mozambique. This meant there were trade sanctions. By 1990, the economy was really flagging. And oppressing most of the population was so expensive that the state could not continue. But also, with the collapse of communism and the Soviet Union, apartheid South Africa had lost its main trump card of being a bulwark against communism, which is why the UK's Margaret Thatcher and America's Ronald Reagan had actually supported South Africa during the 1980s. So de Klerk saw his power base crumble by the minutes, basically. 
yeah, certainly inside the country and outside of the country. And it actually also caught a lot of people within South Africa off guard. You know, the uh, ANC and local organizations, local political organizations actually needed some time to prepare for this monumental uh, moment. And it it actually set up a, set off a lot of chaos within South Africa at the time. I can imagine because I mean, you precipitate Mandela's release and then you don't give enough time or room to avoid that mass chaos. Um, so yeah, that's understandable. Kai, let's get into why Mandela was this gigantic anti-apartheid icon at the time when he'd been locked up for 27 years. We also have to remember Mandela wasn't the only anti-apartheid icon by any means, but certainly probably the most famous one. I mean, he was born in the Eastern Cape in 1918, and he went on to study law at Witwatersrand University in Johannesburg in 1943. In fact, he would actually go on to... He, he, so, so Mandela became this lawyer, and he would actually go on to establish the only black-owned law firm in Johannesburg at the time. So a couple of years before Mondlane's passage there, um, how long was it before he got into politics? Well, it wasn't long before Mandela himself became engaged in politics. You know, he'd moved to uh, Johannesburg, which is also the place where a lot of people who were act politically active or uh, a lot of young people had actually migrated to for many reasons. But it was there in Johannesburg that he co-founded the African National Congress Youth League in 1944. And as he rose through the ranks of the Youth League, South Africa became an apartheid state in 1948. And it then began implementing this increasingly draconian uh, strategy of apartheid. And this included laws that codified the division of people based on skin color, and all of this makes Mandela's uh, political activity important, but also more and more risky. I mean, as one can definitely imagine, but what were the core reasons for that? Well, because the regime systematically began banning and arresting anti-communist forces. Uh, remember, this was their big trump card that they were that that the apartheid government was against communism. And while the ANC was involved with or, you know, shared interests with the South African Communist Party, members were actually targeted because they opposed the apartheid state. And while in the early days the ANC called for peaceful opposition, universal human rights and equality, Mandela soon went underground as repression and atrocities such as the horrific Sharpeville massacre of 1960 became more common and the state became more repressive. Mandela increasingly advocated for the armed struggle. So clearly Mandela was a marked man here. Kai, did he get caught? Well, it did take a while and also a few arrests before being released again. In fact, Mandela was known as a bit of a, an escape artist because he was so elusive. But eventually Mandela was put on a trial for treason at the so-called Ravonia trials, along with Walter Sisulu, Govan Mbeki and others. Now, officially, he was charged for conspiracy to overthrow the government and sabotage. But really, he was imprisoned for life because he was the most famous opponent of the regime. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's fast forward then back to 1990. Yes, uh, and now you might expect Mandela, who was overwhelmingly popular to sweep to power. Which he did. Yes, and then you would maybe expect him with a certain degree of reason that he might want to punish his uh, former captors and possibly the entire former apartheid state. But when Mandela took power in South Africa's first democratic election of 1994, he sought to unite and reconcile South Africans and actually end ethnic and racial divisions. He strove for what he baptized as the Rainbow Nation. And he could see that in the 80s, South Africa was sliding towards a civil war. That's Razia Saleh of South Africa's Nelson Mandela Foundation. And he took the leap, you know. Madibawa read quite widely on strategies and tactics of the struggle. Um, and he then came to realize that the only way out of the quagmire that we were in was through a negotiated settlement. And in that settlement, if you, you know, he always said, if you negotiate with your, uh, with your enemies, you need to, you need to understand them and you need to give something. 
for them to come to the negotiating party. And how was he as a leader? Mandela did rule, but only for one term. So when Mandela became president of the country, South Africa faced enormous challenges and it was a horribly unequal society. And while Mandela was willing to be patient as his new democracy grew, uh, younger South Africans like Ratijo uh, Mokombe were less patient. I do think he's, he sold South Africans out because he sold them a dream that was so unrealistic. The ideologies he had were brilliant, but were they applicable? No. So I did think he sold South Africa out because he sold them a dream. And here we are today still fighting for the same um, things we were fighting for back then. What sort of dreams is she talking about, though? Much of South Africa's population still remains poor and unemployed. Almost three decades after the fall of apartheid, South Africa's unemployment rate is like 35%, Leila. And we're talking about Africa's second biggest economy. South Africans even say that, economically speaking, the country was one of the most unequal societies in the world during apartheid, but now it is the most unequal society. But, you know, surely one can't pin that on Mandela, though, right? No, I don't think so. And as Razia suggests here, carrying out Mandela's dream is the responsibility of the newer leaders. I mean, Mandela was almost 80 when he stepped back from office. I think the critiques that he sold a dream that couldn't be achieved, I think he was pragmatic and he was hoping that once he laid the basis that other people will follow and we will strive towards that South Africa of his dreams, which unfortunately we are still yet to arrive at. I actually put this question to analyst Ralph Matecha, uh, an expert on South African contemporary politics, especially regarding how uh, the ruling ANC party, so Mandela's party, has ruled since 1994. Uh, I asked him if it's fair to blame Mandela's dream for the current disillusion with the ruling party. I don't think that's fair. I mean, a dream is a potential. So if people give you a vision and you fail to pursue it, is it their problem? And I think that is where it's an escape route for us South Africans where some people blame him for selling out. Whenever we, we run into uh, moral challenges, I'm referring to uh, cases of impropriety and, 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 and the misuse of uh, uh, public resources by, by politicians, by those who have been entrusted to serve the people. Uh, we often refer back to what... Uh, does that mean in terms of uh, what Mandela's legacy should actually be and what Mandela's legacy, uh, how it should be reflected upon by ANC leaders. We we, we often look at Nelson Mandela as uh, someone of a a high moral point in our society, a high moral point in our politics, our ability to overcome uh, tremendous challenges as a nation, and also a sense of uh, selflessness. Uh, given how Nelson Mandela uh, served uh, in jail uh, as a liberation fighter. It is quite a difficult one because uh, ANC leaders uh, currently do not in any way get closer to matching expectations, especially those expectations that are based on uh, what Mandela, Nelson Mandela stood for. So when we look at that now, the ANC is a disappointment. But also, are we being realistic that... uh, such a society can actually be grounded by that ideal and that spirit of Nelson Mandela in the current political, socio-economic environment where greed just seems to be the standard norm. It's a good point. So Mandela died in December 2013. And I actually remember acutely hearing the news when I was in the United States. I, I know exactly where I was at that time when I found out about Mandela's death. And I remember attending a vigil that was held in California on the other side of the world. I remember just having goosebumps, you know, like, you know, when it it just seemed unbelievable when the news came out. But Kai, having grown up in a free South Africa, um, free as arguable, I would say, and having seen the political and economic chaos that has plagued the country since then, do you feel Mandela's dream of equality and freedom can ever truly be realized? Uh, that's now it's your turn to ask big questions, Leila. But um, <laughs> a lot of people forget, of course, where the country was uh, 30 years ago and how close the country was actually to almost a civil war. And 
I'll be honest with you, Leila, there are sometimes when I do feel a little bit hopeless when I think about that. But then I remember something Mandela once said. Uh, it goes along the lines of, it's always... It always seems impossible until it's done. There we go. And he's someone who stood up and eventually stared down apartheid. It's a quote worth taking seriously, eh? <laughs> yeah, you could say that. But you know, quite why Mandela became such an icon, mm, I think Razia Saleh sums it up nicely. So, so he represented the possibility of peace, of hope, of people who are intractable enemies actually finding a common solution. So I think for many people, he symbolized freedom, justice, uh, democracy, all the positive values of the world that, that we look towards. <laughs> That's where we'll have to leave things for today. African Roots is a cooperation between DW and the Gerda Henkel Foundation. Thanks to Comic Republic in Nigeria for the artwork. And a special thanks to our producers, Philip Zadner, and our voiceover artists as well. Contributions by Tuso Kumalo and Carla Fernandez. I'm Leila Johnson-Salami. And I'm Kai Nebe. I see you now.